So we are honored to feature someone who's doing groundbreaking work in the field of psychiatry and neuroscience. Dr. Daniel Siegel is a visionary who has conducted extensive research that led him to develop tools that help people lead more balanced and productive lives. Dr. Siegel received his medical degree from Harvard University and completed his postgraduate medical education at UCLA with training in pediatrics, child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine and the founding co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. An award-winning educator, he is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a recipient of several honorary fellowships. Dr. Siegel has published extensively for the professional audience and has published several books, including Mind Sight, The New Science of Personal Transformation, and four parenting books, including Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. Hmm. Imagine if we could get into those teenage brains, what we would find. His most recent book is Mind, A Journey to the Heart of Being Human, which is the topic of the talk tonight. This is among the books he will sign in the lobby after his talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Siegel. Thank you very much for that introduction, Gina. And I'd like to thank Gina and Jerry for hosting this event. And thank you all for coming out. Um, Caroline Welch and I are partners in this journey of the Mindsight Institute, and this is our first time to the Aspen Institute, and what a place you have. So it's really an honor to be here. And thank you all for coming out. You know, today's talk is about the mind. So before we get started, let me just check in with all of you. How many of you would say that you have a mind? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, so that's a good place to begin. So we're on common ground. Uh, and before we get too deep into this, if you can, turn your cell phones, which distract our minds to vibrate or to not even vibrate, just put them on airplane mode, because we're going to get into some pretty deep kinds of things in this hour we have together, and we want to kind of focus ourselves in this room as best we can. So the first question I'll ask you, if we all have a mind, um, what is the mind? And this is going to be very interactive, so feel free to belt out a phrase if you want to. What is the mind? What's that? Consciousness. Excellent. So what is consciousness? Awareness. And what is awareness? Mindfulness. Okay. This is great. So we have consciousness. We have uh, awareness. We have mindfulness. What is mindfulness? It's connection. Okay. Okay. And connection of what to what? Of being in the moment. Oh, this is great. So this is going to go really deep, right? <laughs> so being in the moment. And, and, and what does being in the moment have to do with the mind? So the mind likes to race and do other things other than being in the moment. But actually, if you think about it, what else is there but the moment, right? Especially if you look at how physicists are talking about time and saying that there is no such thing as flowing time, which we'll get into later. Um, but for now, let's just say we've just described a lot of the contents of mind as descriptions, but we haven't offered yet a definition. Now, the word mind, of course, is used in lots of different fields. You heard that I'm trained. Do you want that, you want that turned off? Yes. There's a request to turn off the screen thing so that we're not distracted. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Great, good. The fullness of emptiness, that's great. Um, so we have this field. I'm trained, as you heard from, from Gina, I'm trained in um, psychiatry. Now, the term psyche from Greek uh, means what? It means soul, and it means spirit and intellect, and also a synonym for mind, right? So iatry is the caretaker, so I'm supposed to be a caretaker of the mind. And when I finished my training in psychiatry, what was strange was no one ever told me what the mind was. And then I had friends who were psychologists, right? Ology is the study of people who study the psyche, the mind. And do you know how 
many people in psychology are offered definition of the mind, the same as psychiatry, basically zero. Actually, the number is about 2%. So over 98% of psychiatrists and psychologists and every other field of mental health is never given a definition of the mind part of mental health. So what I want to ask you at this moment is, how many of you think that's kind of weird? Okay, just a few people. All right. So what I just said was that the field of mental health actually has lost its mind. Now, how can you say what a healthy mind is if you don't say what the mind is? You actually can't, and you probably realize it, that the field of mental health is actually a field of disorders. And so they describe a lot of disorders, and everything I was taught to get my board's certification as a, an adult psychiatrist and a child psychiatrist and an adolescent psychiatrist had zero to do with well-being and everything to do with naming disorders and categorizing people, which used to always make me feel uncomfortable. So I went on a journey, even before I was in uh, training in psychiatry, which was in medical school, and tell me what feels wrong about this. I was a young student. I had been a biochemistry major, and I then went on to medical school. So I knew about molecules in the body and physiology and stuff. But when I first started seeing patients in my first year, the professors would take me on their rounds. They would go into a patient's room. They would say, you know, I have your lab data. I'm sorry to say this, but it looks like you're dying. Three, four months you have, goodbye. And they'd leave. And I'm not kidding. So they'd leave the room, and I'd pull on their white coat. I'd say, excuse me, uh, excuse me. And they go, what? And I go, don't you want to talk to that person about what you just said? They said, why? I've just given them all the information they need to have. Now, what's missing from that? Emotion, exactly. The meaning and emotion of that diagnosis for that person was completely missing from the perceptual vision of that physician. Right? So ultimately, this happened over and over and over again. And when I would always ask about the emotions and meaning of the illness for my patients, I was told it's not what physicians do. So ultimately, I dropped out of school and I went on this long journey. And the bottom line is, when I was away and never thought I'd go back, I realized that there are two kinds of perceptual systems we have. One sees the physical world, let's just call it physical sight, like doing labs on a person and then seeing what the numbers are and telling them they're gonna, their body's going to physically die. But then there's another kind of perceptual system that's quite distinct. That's when you see the inner subjective experience of someone their meanings, their emotions, their thoughts, their memories, their intentions. And that you can call mind sight. So I went back to school, and I was like an anthropologist studying these professors who lacked mind sight and how it was almost like a form of malpractice. And you know how sometimes it's good to see a bad play because then you appreciate a good one? So I would use these as anti-role models, right, on how you should not be as a physician, and that allowed me to get through school. But what was interesting about it, when I finished medical school, I went to pediatrics, and in pediatrics I noticed that the families who were dealing with really severe illnesses, at UCLA we had very severely ill kids, the families with mind sight did better overall than the families that didn't have it. So then I started teaching this mind sight ability to those families, and they would do better with the same kind of medical illness. So when I went into psychiatry, it was really strange to me that everyone was talking about disorders and never well-being. So I'd like you to picture this. I got a, a grant to study how relationships between a parent and a child uh, influence the child's development. And it was in 1989. Uh, and the people in my training program, my professors, thought I was crazy because I wasn't studying a disease. I was studying well-being and how it emerged from relationships. And they thought that was like the nuttiest thing they'd ever heard of. So the whole culture in modern psychiatry, in the whole field of mental health, in fact, was always about disorder. When I finished that program and they asked me to be the training director in child and adolescent psychiatry, it was the beginning of the decade of the brain, and everyone was saying this simple phrase, the mind is what the brain does. 
And think about that. The mind is what the brain does. Now, who first said that? Does anyone know? Hippocrates said it 2,500 years ago. It's not new. 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates in Greece said, all of your joys and sorrows, all of your mental life comes from inside your head. And then what did William James, the father of modern American psychology, say 125 years ago in his Principles of Psychology? Some of you may have read that beautiful book. It is so obvious that the mind is just coming from the brain that everything I'm going to say just supports that obvious conclusion. So if I'm here talking about the mind and I was a neuroscientist or an academic psychiatrist or psychologist alone, I would say to you, well, it's obvious the mind is brain activity. And maybe that's true. So when the decade of the brain was around and I had finished my training and I was now a, a young professor, I invited all of my teachers, who are now, of course, my colleagues, to ask one question in a group. And the question was, what is the connection between the mind and the brain? So for a neuroscientist, the room was obvious. She said, the mind is what the brain does. But what would an anthropologist say about that sitting in the room? What does an anthropologist study? Well, you know what a brain scientist studies, right? The brain. So an anthropologist studies anthros. No. An anthropologist study, studies human culture, right? Now, an anthropologist in the room, she said, the mind is not just what happens in the brain. The mind is what happens in a culture. It's what happens across generations. It's what's passed through practices that we have that are embedded in symbols. And a linguistics person, he said exactly, he said, of course the mind is relational. And a sociologist in the room said, yes, of course, that's how groups function. The mind is a relational product. And the psychologists in the room were so angry, and the neuroscientists said, this is really stupid. And no one had anything respectful to say to each other. So I'm going to ask you this little challenge. If the one question is, what is the connection between the mind and the brain, how would you get this group of 40 academics to collaborate with each other? If the anthropologists and sociologists and linguistic people are studying relationships, which they do, and the academic psychologists and psychiatrists and brain scientists are studying the brain, which is what we were doing, what is shared in common between a brain and a relationship? Now, I'm giving you a little bit of an academic challenge because this question actually can be the gateway to you learning something in this one hour that can change your life. So what do they share in common? What, what does a relationship share in common with the brain? And then we're going to ask the next question, of course, what does the mind have anything to do with that? So the first time I talked about this outside of that group was in Poland, and, and we were teaching uh, the former Soviet bloc countries about how to deal with trauma, because in the former Soviet Union, you know, you weren't allowed to talk about child abuse. So there were a lot of abused children, then adolescents, then adults, who were then repeating this generational passage of abuse. So we went in as mental health professionals to teach these mental health professionals who were never taught about this about it. And one of my American colleagues, a faculty member, said, that is the craziest thing I ever heard. Why would you talk about relationships in the brain? That's dumb. So it wasn't a common thing to talk about. Why would a relationship that's abusive seriously malform the brain of a child? Which now we know is true. In certain ways you're going to hear about it in a few moments. So what is this connection that relationships can be so profound that they shape the actual anatomy of the brain? Which is true. So here's what I want you to think about. What's... Like, what happened when I stopped sending sound waves to you? 
You're going to tell the technician to tell the mic is off. Exactly. So something really significant happens when I, or, you know, if I duck behind here, right, and you can't see me anymore or something like that. Okay. So what is sound? Sound is a way to relate for sure. Absolutely. But what is it from a physics point of view? You know, in the room, it's vibrations. And what's a vibration? What's a good vibration? Good, good. <laughs> What's a vibration? It's energy. Exactly. It's energy. And if I say Aspen, it's one kind of pattern. And if I say Santa Monica, it's another kind of pattern. They're both energy but different patterns, right? If I go like that, it's just gibberish because it's pure energy. So some energy has symbolic value. We call that information. Some energy is just pure energy. And, you know, sometimes it depends on who you are. Do it, does anyone speak Greek? Anyone speak Greek in the room? No? Okay. So if I say Gli Canada, if you were Greek, you'd get really excited because it means sweet water, and it's this incredible nudist beach on Crete that... <laughs> I can tell you at the break how to get there, but when you're 25 and you're living in this nudist colony, it's a cool place to be. Um, but for you, it was just Greek, right? It's just Greek to me. So energy is the fundamental unit, and some physicists say information is the fundamental unit. So to make everybody happy in physics, you say energy and information. Because it changes, we're going to use the word flow. So from now on, for the rest of today, we're going to talk about energy and information flow. So... What's a relationship? It's the sharing of that flow, like right now between me and you. And I could have come here and said, uh, Jerry and Gina, thank you very much for having me come to Aspen. What a neat place you have. Like that, right? And it would be a very different kind of energy experience, right? So a relationship is based on the sharing of energy and information flow, OK? What's the brain? What is the brain, actually? Let's start with that one. Well, let's, let's start with a simpler question. Where is the brain? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we learned in anatomy. Up there, one brain, two eyes, one nose. <laughs> That's what I remember from anatomy. OK, so what is the brain? How does the brain work? The an the basically, if you have a long, long axon of a nerve, it's ions flowing in and out of a membrane. That's energy flow, electrical energy flow. When it gets to the end of the axon, it releases a chemical. The chemical releases across the space called a synapse. And it's the, the chemical, the neurotransmitter, is basically like a key. And the receptor is like a lock. And it's a chemical transformation. So if you had to do an elevator speech, a really fast elevator speech about what the brain is, you would say it's an organ of the body that mediates electrochemical energy transformation. And some of those neural firing patterns have symbolic value, so it's information. So energy and information actually flows through not just your head, but through your whole body. So what do we just say relationships in the brain share in common now? Energy information. It's the mechanism we're just going to call the brain, and the sharing we're going to call relationships. So now we get to the next question. We just found a common ground, which is really, really, really powerful from an academic point of view. But from a practical point of view, now we get to the mind part. Besides subjective experience, which you feel within consciousness, and information processing like your emotions and thoughts and memories and stuff like that, those are all important descriptions of the mind. Let's put those aside for a moment. But let's look at the system. Would it, it, let's say that in this group of 40 scientists, they were all right. I mean, not all right, but they were all correct. You know, They, were, they all were onto something really powerful. Relationships are a part of the mind, and the brain is a part of the mind. What is that system? That system actually is energy and information flow. And the way to think about it is energy and information flow is not limited by your skull, and it's not even limited by your skin. So while it seems like it's two places at once, within you and between you, it's one place. It's one system, and the quality of that system has three characteristics to it 
Oh, this is the only math you're going to get today. But the math is this. It's called a complex system because it has these three features. It's open to influences from outside itself. This is straight out of math. How many of you feel like your mental life, your feelings and thoughts, gets influenced by stuff outside of what you would call yourself? Anybody have that experience? Raise your hand really high. This is the aerobic part of the exercise thing. Good. Okay. So you're an open system. The second characteristic is it's called chaos capable, which on a s simplistic level means roughly you can have a pretty chaotic day, pretty random day. Anybody have a random day recently? Okay. So you're a chaos capable open system. The third feature, which for many mathematicians is the main feature, is you are nonlinear, which means a small input leads to large and on the surface, difficult to predict results. Any of you find that something happens to you in the morning and you couldn't have predicted what was going to happen at the end of the day? Raise your hand if that's true. Okay, so many of us are open, chaos-capable, nonlinear systems. So you are called a complex system. And here's the fundamental issue. And Jerry works at the Santa Fe Institute. They study this all the time. A complex system has emergent properties things that arise from them, like water molecules and air molecules comprising a cloud. One of the emergent properties is called self-organization. And self-organization sounds like a fancy California term, but it's actually a mathematical term. And it means that you are regulating, and because you're emergent, you're emerging from something, and then because you're self-organizing, you are regulating that from which you arose, which is completely counterintuitive. That is, how could you regulate the thing you're arising from, which means you're then arising from the thing you just regulated? That's actually what it means. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you is a definition of the mind. The mind, beyond consciousness and its subjective experience, beyond information processing, maybe related to them, maybe not. In this last book, Mind, I wrestle with that throughout the whole book. But this fourth aspect of mind is this. The mind can be defined as the emergent, self-organizing, where is it? Embodied, not just in skull, and relational process. Because the system is not bound by skull or skin. The system of mind is energy and information flow, and the self-organizing aspect of mind is arising from both within and between. Now, you may say, who cares about that? Why did you guys invite this dude here? Here's why you can care about it. Because then you can ask this fundamental question. What is a healthy mind? Because you can ask the question, what is optimal self-organization? And there's an answer. So in the group of 40 people back in 1992, what was fascinating about it was I presented that as a definition to them after they were fighting with each other the first meeting. And every one of the 40 scientists said, I can go with that with my work. I can go with that. And we met for four and a half years with deep, deep, really collaborative, respectful discussions. And as a mental health professional, what became really interesting about that back in the early 90s, the beginning of the decade of the brain, was instead of being fooled by what everyone was saying was the mind is just brain activity, it allowed for a much bigger picture. So let me give you the take-home message. Optimal self-organization is how when you leave this room and you walk out those doors and you say, what did I remember from what that guy said? At least remember this one little bit we're about to talk about. Because if you want to optimize your life, if you follow the path of what I'm about to say, every bit of research supports that it will lead to well-being in your life. It will lead to you flourishing in your body, thriving in your relationships. What I'm about to tell you is at the basis of what will actually raise an enzyme in your body called telomerase to repair the ends of your chromosomes. So your chromosomes have like, you know how you have your shoelace has a cap. Can I borrow your shoe? <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. So here's Jerry's shoe. He's never donated this. Let's hear it for Jerry for donating the shoe, for sponsoring this whole thing. 
So on the on the caps of, of Jerry's shoe, like everyone's shoelaces here, you have a, uh, you have a cap on the shoelace. Now, if that cap frays, right, and the, the string will just start fraying a lot, right? And that's really hard to get it through the, there's a name for these loopholes, but whatever they're called. What do you call them? The eyelets. Oh, that's so beautiful, eyelets. I feel like I'm in Hawaii. The eyelets of Hawaii. Um, so you want to keep your caps intact. So here's the thing about the telomeres. Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for discovering the system I'm about to describe to you. And Elizabeth Blackburn with Alyssa Eppel actually discovered how what you do with your mind not only changes the structure of your brain, but it actually raises the enzyme. These are called telomeres, the caps. The enzyme that repairs and maintains them is called telomerase. ASE in medicine is uh, an enzyme, no, actually in biology. So what we do with Jerry's shoes is we keep them young and vibrant because we have an enzyme that's going to keep these caps intact. Aging deteriorates your telomeres. Stress deteriorates your telomeres. And what you do with your mind can raise the enzyme. It can't keep you alive forever, but it can literally keep you younger because mental states of receptive awareness called presence are the best predictor of you raising telomerase levels. So that's the soul of the matter. So <laughs> my, don't tell my kids I said that because they would not like that. So they say, Dad, you cannot tell a joke. And I said, you're joking. And they said, yeah, we are not joking. <laughs> Okay, so here's the, here's the story. You can raise your telomerase levels, what I'm about to tell you. You can also have the non-DNA molecules that sit on top of your genes. These are called epigenetic regulators. These are histones and methyl groups. You don't need to worry what they are. But basically, you can optimize how your genome will help you fight off inflammation. And as you probably know, the big revolution in medicine in the last eight to ten years is most of the major diseases we have heart disease cancer diabetes are due to inflammation and the subchapter of that revolution is all about the biome as well and how the bacteria in our our, our gi system are actually influencing our inflammatory states anyway what you do with your mind can optimize the way you're Epigenetic regulators are going to sit on top of the regions of your genome to prevent inflammation from happening. These are these two things, telomerase and the epigenetic regulation of, of inflammation areas of the genome, are published in the most rigorous peer-reviewed journals that exist in science. I'm not just making this stuff up. This is hard, hard science. You'll improve your immune system. You'll even change the structure of your brain to keep the areas that usually whittle away as you get older, you'll keep them robust. These are proven ways of actually using your mind to change not just your brain and your body in all these ways, but it actually improves empathy and compassion. It improves emotional intelligence and social intelligence. So what is it? It's very simple. If you take this word mindsight we talked about and break it down to its three parts, it's insight into your inner life so people can develop this inner capacity for reflection. Not everybody has it, but almost everyone can learn it. So that's insight, the first part of mindsight. Number two is empathy. The way we get these relationships that Gene was talking about that help us actually live longer, be happier, have more mental health, and ho have more medical health. Those are all research proven findings of what relationships do. They come from the capacity for empathy, to have supportive networks of social connections. So we have insight into yourself. Empathy for others. The third thing is the answer to the question, how do you optimize self-organization? And you do this through a process that we're just going to call integration. Integration is the linkage of differentiated parts. So I look at my watch, 
and I'm going to differentiate what time it is now compared to what time we have to stop. And then I link to that, and so it become a more integrated fluidity with the time of the calendar, right? You integrate in your relationships by honoring differences and promoting linkages. So integration is defined this simple way. Differentiation plus linkage. That's it. So back in 1992, I looked up everything I could find in mathematics about linking and differentiating, and here's the amazing thing. When a complex system is not differentiating linking, it goes to one of two states that you may be familiar with. It gets either chaotic or it gets rigid. And I went, oh my God. And I went to the Diagnostic Bible of Psychiatric Disorders. Every symptom of every syndrome of every disorder that's in that book can fall into the category of chaos or rigidity. And the only branch of science that points that out is mathematics. So that's really interesting. Then you say, well, hold on, that's disorder. What about optimal functioning? And it comes with this quality that's harmony. In fact, does anyone sing in a choir? Do any of you sing in a choir? You know I'm going to ask you to volunteer, but there's only two people raising their hands. Okay, just imagine if, a, if, a, if some volunteers were up here and they were going to sing in the choir. Imagine if we had them not differentiate, just sing the same note the same way for like three hours. I'll give you a little sample. Uh, so they were linked but not differentiated. Would they be integrated? No. In this case, it would be rigidity. Now, imagine this sample choir we have. They plug their ears as tightly as they can. They're going to differentiate like crazy, belt out a song with words. Blah, 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 blah. What would that sound like? Chaos. chaos. It would be chaos. It would be cacophony, and it wouldn't feel very comfortable. Now, imagine, and I've done this so many times, I'll tell you what happens. Imagine we're in a workshop like this, and we say, okay, you guys, um, get together and sing in a song. And I step away. Now, I step away. Because self-organization does not require a conductor. It doesn't require, like Bill Gates, the programmer, to program self-organization. It naturally arises, and this is a complex system. Let's say we have 10 choir singers. Seven out of 10 times in America when I do this, you know which song they pick? You tell me. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. It's the most harmonious song in the Western canon of songs. Now, how are they singing? They're differentiating and linking. How do, would that sound? Can you imagine that? It feels vital. It feels energized. So here's the weird thing from 1992. I said, okay, well, if the mind is a self-organizing, emergent, embodied, and relational process, not just the brain, which other people had said, the brain is self-organizing, whatever. No, the mind is something much bigger than the brain. This is the idea. So watch this. Secure attachment between a parent and a child, between you and your child, or a good relationship that you have between you and your partner, let's say, or a friend. How would you differentiate from each other? What would you do? Well, if you went to a restaurant, for example, you'd order different things. If you went for ice cream, you'd order different flavors of ice cream. That's how you differentiate, but you'd go together to the, I bless you, you'd go together to the ice cream place, right? So, that would be differentiating and linking. When you were talking, you would be respectful and collaborative. What Dan Goldman wrote in my book, Mindsight, is he said, Mindsight, this insight, empathy, and integration, is the basis of emotional intelligence. It's the basis of social intelligence. It's the basis of well-being because it promotes integration. So here's the really, really, really strange thing. With presence, that is when you're open and receptive, you're allowing a differentiation of your feelings and thoughts. So basically, literally, and this is a part of what mindful awareness is, you're allowing things to arise and you're curious about them, you're open to them, you're accepting of them, you have a sense of love toward them. If you didn't notice, that spells the acronym COLE. Curious, open, accepting, and loving. That is the quality of presence that raises your telomerase levels, that improves your epigenetic control to prevent inflammation. Why? Because it's an integrated state of mind. You go, well, how is that integrated? Because what you're doing is you're allowing the differentiated mental experience to arise and be linked together within consciousness. 
Now, this may sound weird, but you can have your mind creating integration on purpose, let's say in a relationship or with mindfulness practice, yoga, tai chi, qigong, centering prayer, mindful dishwashing, if that's what does it for you. Caroline's very happy about that. Um, and you can be present for what arises. So you're differentiating the different things that happen, and then you're allowing yourself to link them. We have a practice at the Mindsight Institute. Caroline Welch has created as the CEO our web presence there. But you'll go there and you'll see this wheel of awareness practice. I've done it in person now with over 10,000 people. We've had almost a million people download it from the website. And it's an integration of consciousness practice you can do tonight when you get home. Because you may say, I wanted to do a practice. We have a lot to cover. You can go home, go to our website, drdansiegel.com, and then you go to resources, and for free, you do the wheel. How would you integrate consciousness? Let's come back to where we started. Everyone started with consciousness, what the mind is. If I said to you, integrating consciousness could be a step you can take tonight, tomorrow morning. You can actually say, how do I integrate my life? You begin with consciousness. How? The wheel. Let me ask you. Integration has which two components? Differentiate and link. Exactly. So let's start with differentiation. What is consciousness, and how would you differentiate its components from each other? Now, you're not alone in this. Caroline and I were teaching in Singapore together, and we had two students of consciousness. One was a, a uh, meditation student who had just come out of three years of silence in a cave, the other was a guy who had been doing three years of research on the neural correlates of consciousness in Singapore. It was an amazing moment. We had a bunch of mindfulness teachers there, and we were there having dinner with these two. And I said, hey, this is an incredible opportunity. You're both in your late 20s, wonderful guys. Oh, thank you, thank you, they said. And I said, so why don't you tell us what's consciousness? And they got this kind of frightened expression on their look. Three years, one had been in a cave. Three years, one had been in study. And uh, they're both their supervisors were there too. Uh, so, so I said, well, how would you define consciousness? And they go, one, one person, the meditator said, I'm not sure, I don't know. And I turned to the scientist and said, what about you? He goes, we don't know, that's why we're studying it. We have no idea. I said, well, how would you even define it? They go, we don't know. I said, well, you were just in a cave for three years. What'd you learn? And he said, my mind gets very distracted. <laughs> that's what he said. His teacher wasn't very happy about that, but <laughs> it was an amazing moment. So. If you take all the different things about consciousness, consciousness can be divided into at least two things. The experience of knowing is probably the most basic way of defining awareness. But then you also have the knowns of consciousness. So with my patients, back in the 90s, I had this, designed this table with a big glass hub, the center of the, the, the table, and an outer wooden rim. And I said, look, imagine if you put the knowing in this gl clear glass, let's call it a wheel, not, not a table of awareness, a wheel of awareness, and you make this glass center the hub of knowing. And what if you put on the rim all these knowns? They said, okay. And then we would go around. So in the first segment of the rim, what, give me an example of a known from your first five senses. What would that be? Bless you. Let's have a bless you if everyone's going to sneeze. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. So... What would be an example of a known? Smell, exactly. What else? Taste, sight, hearing, touch. Excellent. First five senses. Now you move the spoke of attention over now to the next segment of the rim, which in science is called the sixth sense, the interior of the body, the signals of your muscles and bones, the sensations of your genitals, your intestines, your heart, your respiratory system. And you do a review of this. Then what else could be a known besides the interior of the body and the outside world? Thoughts, exactly. You move this book over one more time to this third segment of the room. It's your thoughts, your emotions, your memories, your intentions, your hopes, your dreams, your longings, your desires, your beliefs. And you explore that. And then an advanced step, which we did in Singapore, it was amazing. We had these monastery heads, these Zen whatever they're called. What do you call the head of a monastery? I forgot. The head of a monastery, that's what you call them. Anyway, they did this practice. They were so excited about it because we bend the spoke of attention around and aim it straight back into the hub of knowing. And then amazing things happen, I'll tell you about in a moment. But you then straighten the spoke out and then you move the spoke to the final sense, which isn't just the thoughts and feelings. It's our relationships with each other. 
And so the practice has been so amazing because it's not only integrating consciousness so people would get over anxiety and depression and trauma in these amazing ways in my clinical practice, but in workshops, people would find it deeply illuminating about the very nature of mind. So what I'm going to do with you now is just take a quick leap to a quantum view of mind and then open up for questions because um, there's some absolutely profound things that are beginning to emerge. And um, I've been working um, this uh, recent time with some quantum physicists about a proposal that comes from this 10,000 person study of the wheel, all this feedback we get about the wheel practice, and then this view of the mind. Because we'll start with this. If I tell you, if you begin to integrate consciousness, your life will begin to transform toward well-being. That's what the data suggests. And that, for example, mindfulness practice is an example of that. Secure attachment is an example of that. These are all ways you integrate energy and information flow. So if it all comes down to energy flow, because information is a subset of energy, if I asked you what is energy, what would you say? Right, because I just said, hey, the mind is an emergent aspect of energy, and, you, and I could have just let it slip. But if you really want to get deep, you have to say, okay, fine. What does that mean? It's meaningless unless you say what energy is. So I've been hanging around with these quantum physicists. Actually, there was a hundred and there were 150 physicists, most of them quantum physicists, in this meeting where we were together for a week in an old monastery. If you can picture that, somebody's got to do this kind of thing. And it was in Tuscany, and I was eating gluten then, so all the pasta was, it was a hard life. But, and this is where I met the guy from the Santa Fe Institute, whose name I can't remember. Um, anyway, so we were all hanging out together. And um, so I would say to these quantum physicists, I'd say, okay, you are the experts in the world on energy, which they are. And I would say, so what is energy? Kind of like I asked those students about consciousness. And they would say, well, we don't know what energy is. I said, come on, you have it in all your equations, you know, E equals MC squared, all that kind of stuff. What is energy? They said, okay, okay, okay. Energy is basically the movement from possibility to actuality. I go, say what? And they go, it's the movement from possibility to actuality. That's what it is. Like right now, for example, I'm about to say something to you. How old are you? Not you, you. 13. Excellent. So you are 13. I wrote a book for you called Brainstorm, right? And it's all about what's happening in the energy of your brain as it's changing in this fabulous time of life. And all these people put energy into what happens to 13-year-olds, you know, at a certain time of life in our culture that makes it like it's a bad thing, right? Like hormones are going to drive you crazy and all these wild things are going to happen. Have you heard that stuff? Yeah, she's not. A, yes, exactly. So I thought that's nuts because actually adolescence is this beautiful time when there's this incredible essence of an emotional spark called passion, social engagement where you're connected with your peers, right? Novelty where you want to try things with courage and new ways and creative exploration where you challenge your mind. And in fact, what we do in schools usually is we get mad at adolescents for their essence. So if you take the energy of this book, Brainstorm, for example, we're going to talk about energy, you take a possibility that was there all along, you put the energy into it, and the energy can become the actuality of what adolescents your age, because I wrote the book for people your age to read, are finding transforms their lives, because that potential was there all along. Right? And it's like Goethe said about, you know, if you don't see the potential in someone and treat them with the potential that they have, they will never realize what's possible for them to become, right? And so we have this attitude in our country toward adolescence that is so negative that adolescents just rise to the lowest level of their, of their expectations around them. So now we're working with schools all over the country around how to transform the nature of school so that the essence of adolescence can be honored. That's the idea of possibility, actuality. Or right now, to make it simpler, I'm about to say a word. Let's say there are seven billion words I can choose from. Which word am I going to pick? You, you don't know, right? It's, it's virtually infinite possibility, but the certainty of you picking it is near zero, right? Because you don't know which word. So I will pick the word 
aspen tree. That's two words, sorry. I'll pick the word tree. All right, so I picked the word tree, fine. So tree now becomes a certainty out of the infinite pool of possibility. How did I do that? Energy flow. If you map this out, it's called the probability distribution curve. The bottom line, we've already blessed you. <sighs> so the bottom line is this. Here's the really, really weird take-home message. The distinction between knowing and known in consciousness, the place we started today when I asked you what the mind was, looks like, and this is what I'm presenting to quantum physicists now, and they are extremely excited about it because it's consistent with quantum physics, but not in quantum physics yet anyway. And it's all what this new mind book is about, is that y when you allow people to do this wheel of awareness practice, and they bend the spoke around, so instead of paying attention to a known, which is like a peak of certainty, where, okay, I know I'm thinking I should, should have made dinner, I didn't go shopping, next month I've got to do this, last week I should have done that, all the thoughts that we're preoccupied with, those are these actualities of energy flow. But when people drop from the actualities of the knowns and bend this spoke of attention around, whether they've never meditated before in their life or they're heads of monasteries, and no matter what country they're in, no matter what age they are, no matter what background they are, they describe exactly the same thing. Here's what they say when they bend the spoke of attention, this wheel of awareness practice around, and aim it into the hub. And we've recorded these, and now these are part of the study. I felt this incredible sense of expansiveness I felt incredibly huge. I felt infinite. I felt God. I felt love. I felt incredible safety. The first time I did this, because I teach with Jack Cornfield, we did the wheel practice. It was in Seattle. After the break, after one does it, a 70-year-old Microsoft engineer who had just retired, whose wife, who was a therapist, dragged him to the conference. He didn't want to come. He did the wheel practice. He takes the microphone. He goes like this. I don't know what you just did to me. And so Jack and I go, what happened? He goes, I did the wheel practice. I did just what you said. Good Microsoft engineer. He said, I bent the spoke around. And suddenly, I've never had that feeling. I don't even know what to say. And then we said, well, tell us more. He goes, well, then we had the break. And then I went outside. Was it where that Seattle Needle is, whatever that park is called? He goes, I went outside, and I saw the, I don't need, like, the gardener? Yeah, the gardener holding the, the hose. Yeah, the hose. And this water was going out. It was like spraying everywhere. And, and the birds were flying, the butterflies. And he goes, I realized we're all the same thing. And he starts to cry. And everyone in the room is incredibly moved. And this happens over and over and over and again. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you may be happening that we're going to open up for discussion. It's very possible that, number one, if the mind is an emergent process of energy flow, that's what our proposal was when we started. One aspect may be self-organization, and integration may be the basis of health. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But it begins with accessing consciousness because consciousness is the portal for integration to arise. So then you say, well, what is consciousness really? It's a knowing. And here's what may be happening. When you bring that energy probability curve position down from peaks of actuality to these plateaus of higher probability, down, 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 to an open plane of possibility, that's where the sense of the infinite happens. And suddenly, as this Microsoft engineer and everyone after him has experienced, when they do this, if they experience it, my plane of possibility and your plane of possibility and your plane of possibility and your plane of possibility are basically the same. Infinite is infinite. And if this is true then, it helps us understand how a practice, for example, like mindfulness training, whether it's through yoga or tai chi or qigong, 
they drop you out of these peaks and plateaus and they drop you into this plane. The hub of the wheel is the plane of possibility. And that is a portal for integration. So Alyssa Eppel, who did the studies of telomerase, for example, she and I and two of my interns, we wrote this chapter about how the plane of possibility can explain why telomerase levels rise. And I just wrote an article with Barb Fredrickson, who was the one who studied these um, epigenetic regulators about inflammation, about how this plane of possibility can explain, in fact, how you allow the optimization of epigenetic control by what you do with your mind, because your mind, with presence, can drop into this plane of possibility, where integration arises. And then the amazing thing is that integration, linking of differentiated parts, is something a mindfulness practice does, and you can learn to do it yourself. It's what relationships are based on for health. And what about the brain? Well, every psychiatric disorder where there's a disturbance of thought or emotion or attention, in fact, any of them never been studied, integration is what's impaired in the brain, every single study. And then in October of 2015, the International Human Connectome Project, you know what it showed? Of every way of measuring well-being they could find, one brain feature predicted well-being. It was how integrated your brain is, how linked the differentiated areas of the brain of your connectome are. That's the fancy word for the differentiated areas being linked. So we now have, literally now, what, I, what we didn't have back 25 years ago when this whole journey started, we now have incredible empirical support for the following statement that I'll leave you with and we'll open it up for discussion. The mind changes your relationships and makes them more integrated to promote well-being. The mind can change your brain, literally, the structure of your brain and make it more integrated. And every form of what's called regulation, Regulating your mood, so you have joy in your life. Regulating your emotions, so you have balanced emotions. Regulating your thought, so you think clearly. Regulating your attention, regulating your behavior, regulating your relationships, regulating your morality. Without exception, I had 15 interns work with me to revise a developing mind where we reviewed it. I said, this can't be true. Find an exception. They couldn't find one exception. Every form of regulation depends on integration in the brain. Because integration allows you to coordinate and balance things. So what's the take-home message? You can use your mind to integrate your brain. That is the basis for brain health. You can use your mind to integrate your relationships. That's the basis for longevity, happiness, mental and medical health. And in terms of our wonderful 13-year-old here, the essence of adolescence, an emotional spark, which is passion, this spells essence. SE is social engagement, which is our connections with each other and the planet. Novelty, which is having the courage to try new things, so courage. Creative exploration, having imagination and thinking outside of the box. I think a lot of parents get mad at their adolescents because they've lost their essence and they're jealous. Seriously. Now, not only are they jealous, but here's the sad thing. If you did a summary, which I did, of every study of neuroplasticity, that is how you keep your brain young as you grow older, if you said, what are the three or four factors that you as adults, you're an adolescent, you don't need to worry about this because you already have it, but if you, if you said, what can I do to keep my brain young as I get older? Here it is, guess what? Keep passion in your life with an emotional spark. Keep social engagement in your life, connections to others that give you a sense of purpose. Being of service to others gives meaning, connection, purpose. Novelty, do things in new ways. And CE, creative explorations, allow your imagination to go beyond just what you're familiar with. So the essence of an adolescence life that, that we all had when we used to be back then, we often lose, and yet it's exactly what we need to hold on to. So instead of people saying, oh, I want to get through adolescence, get over it at such a bad period of time, just the opposite is true. Hold on to your essence throughout the lifespan. The last thing I'll leave you with is this. If you said, well, okay, this is all good, but I don't really care about the mind. I care about myself. Come on, Dan, tell me something about myself. Let me ask you, where does the self come from? 
Your mind, excellent. So what would an integrated self be based on everything you just learned? Someone tell me. What is integration comprised of? Differentiation and linkage. If you don't have it, you go to chaos and rigidity. If you do have it, you have harmony and well-being and creativity. Fine. That's the take-home principle. Now, how would you make an integrated self? Where is the mind? It's in the whole body. Where else is the mind? It's in relationships. And it's in the body, and it's between you and the world, you and other people. So it's within and between. So if a me is a word we can use for the bodily self, like I want to exercise this body well, I want to give this body good nutrients, I want to sleep this body well, sleep is really, really important, I want to you know, do really wonderful things and enjoy this body, great, that's all me. Me, 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 that's fine. We don't want to get rid of that. There's no reason to get rid of that. But connecting to other people, finding purpose in life, through service to others' well-being is cl the clear studies, not just of wisdom, which is true. You want to live a wise life, be of service to others, and have insight into yourself. But here's the thing. When you allow yourself to realize connecting to others is a source of the mind, you realize it's a source of a self. Let's just call that we. You and the trees, you and the planet, you and other people, you and your pets. But how would you have an integrated self if you got a me on the one hand and a we on the other hand? So I started doing this lecture called Me to We, like just let's just be an us, you know, and let's all kumbaya and stuff like that. And one of my online students got so mad at me during the break. She says, I am so pissed off at you. I said, why are you pissed off? She goes, your lecture is called Me to We. I, yeah, I said, yeah, doesn't that sound good? She said, yeah, it rhymes, but it's stupid. I said, why is it stupid? She goes, because you taught us to be in touch with our inner lives, know our history, parenting from the inside out. She says, you know, know where you've come from so you can liberate yourself in the future. I said, yeah. She goes, that's all me. I said, that's great. Me is good. She goes, well, then why is it called me to we? I said, you know, you're right. She said, well, rename it. I said, well, how about not only me, but also we? And she goes, well, that doesn't rhyme. <laughs> so she goes, think of something else. I go, okay, think of something else. Think of something else. So I said, okay. Integration, you maintain differentiation and you make linkages. So it's more like a fruit salad than a smoothie. You're not like blending things up, you know? It's where the phrase comes, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So we have to maintain a me and maintain a we, but bring them together. So I said, ah, how about if we say we are a we? M-W-E, and she goes, I love it. So this is what I want to leave you with. We can bring more integration into the world because ultimately when we do this, not only is it going to be we bien, <laughs> but <laughs> you know what integration made visible is when it's integration from the inside out, when you're living it fully, sharing it with each other, having it in the me, having it in the we, having the we, integration made visible is kindness and compassion. And these are the days, more than ever, that we have to have a distributed empowerment of young people, like our wonderful 13-year-old is here, and all of us who are moving beyond 13, because we are all responsible for each other, and we're all responsible for the planet, and it's a win-win-win situation. Because when you start promoting this kindness and compassion, everyone will benefit. And thank you for your kind attention. So I think we have a little time, because we started late, to do five, ten minutes of question and answers. And then there is a book signing. Thank you. There is a book signing, too, at the end, so I can talk more questions later. We have microphones on both sides of the room. So if you have a question, um, please keep it to questions, and unless there's a really great joke you want to tell that I can try to memorize for my kids. Um, over here, here's a question right here. So Dr. Siegel, um, I am so happy to be here. Um, mm. And my intention, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Can everyone hear? Can you hear me? Is that, there you go. Um, and my question to you, and this is a shameless plug too, but my question is what's the role of technology in terms of scaling what you're talking about. Yes. And I'll finish by saying I'm the CEO of a startup company 
building an artificial intelligence platform to do exactly what you're describing. Beautiful. So I'm hoping to convince you to be um, an advisor for us, so I want to figure <laughs> out how. But what's the role of technology? My thank boss you, is right you. here, and, and Caroline Welch is there. Um, well, you. here's the, first of all, it, 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 you know, literally, we need to work at every level of human experience. And when you start realizing that we can collaborate together across the, the platform of humanity, then you start realizing instead of greed, we have something called empathic joy. This is what we want to work. That's the ultimate outcome, right, of integration. So yes, technology is something really important. Y you may go to it already, but you know, every year we do Wisdom 2.0 where we bring tech people together and, and, and I'm there teaching. And, um, and so bring integration in the world exactly so we can talk more, but technology is a form of facilitating energy and information flow across the planet. And there's every reason to believe you could use artificial intelligence use technology to promote more integration in the world. And there's going to be lots of different ways of doing it. And we got to work together to do it because I don't want to get us all like serious at this moment. But we don't have that much time to waste with all the competitiveness and the greed and stuff like that. Our call to action should be collaboration and connection. And we're, I'm happy to talk to you about more later. This is something we all need to do. Think, think about if you could take all the energy that's put into jealousy, greed, and competition and turn it into actually collaboration. So for junior high schools and middle schools and high schools, what I say to them is I said, if you want to have adolescents competing, instead of uh, competing with each other to get into the you know, best high school so they get into the best college so they get into the best like graveyard or something, you know, <laughs> why not have them compete with the world's problems? So when they win the competition, everybody benefits. This is the kind of system we need to create, and it's doable. It is completely doable. We are on the cusp of a transformation of human identity. And if we can get out of the old system, which is all you know, beating each other up with the me, 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 and really think about this, we think, because it isn't just a funny little three-letter word. It's a way of living that has a potential to use technology to kind of create it. Thank you for your question. Yes, here comes a microphone, right here. Here comes the talking stick, you can raise your hand, there you go. Uh, do you believe in the reptilian brain and, um, and how does it fit into this? Yes, this is great. Do I believe in the reptilian brain? So, I, yes, first of all, um, <laughs> as a scientist, I, I suppose I would say it doesn't matter whether I believe in it or not, it, it's there. So, yes. So, so what, do I th what, what are the thoughts about the reptilian brain? You know, if, if usually, uh, usually the lectures I give, the talks I give, the meetings I give go for eight hours or, or you know, 16 hours. So this was kind of stressful for me to do one in, in, in less than an hour. So, um, but yes, so usually we go over this thing called the hand model of the brain. And, and let's just do it together just so you can see. If you take your hand out and put your thumb in the middle, put your fingers over the top, the, the spinal cord in your backbone would be here in your wrist. If you lift up your fingers and lift up your thumb, this brain would be oriented this way, by the way. Um, you have your brain stem that you're referring to here representing your palm. And this is the most developed when we're in utero, so you come out with a pretty well formed. It's about 300 million years old, if you're allowed to say that here. 300 million years old, evolutionarily. Um, some, some schools, you're actually not allowed to say that, believe it or not. So I always have to ask. Um, anyway, then 200 million years uh, ago, we developed a limbic area. That would be your thumb area there. And you have two thumbs to be a perfect model. Most people just have one thumb. Usually I said, you know, we only have one thumb. And then someone said, no, actually, I have a relative uh, and uh, uh, two thumbs. And then another person said, yeah. And I went to a, a gas station, and the person had two thumbs. And the funny thing was, the first time I gave that explanation of why I say now we usually only have one thumb, I went to a gas station, and there was a guy with two thumbs. <laughs> so anyway, go figure. So anyway, most of us have one thumb. Seriously, I want to honor everyone. And, um, and then that's your limbic area, which is your old mammalian brain, 200 million years old. Then if you fold your fingers on top, you have your cortex. So integrating this brain includes taking in the functioning of the reptilian brainstem. And we would do this thing, uh, 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 an exercise where I would activate your brainstem because it's responsible not just for regulating the body, but the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response, four Fs of the brainstem uh, response to threat. Now, here's the key thing. The cortex, which you can, you can um, 
uh, see as the most evolved part of our human brain has the capacity to overcome the proclivities of the brainstem, right? Because it can integrate, literally, it can differentiate itself from the limbic area and the brainstem, and they can overcome them. But some people have a harder time than others, whether they're public figures or not, um, in, in regulating their, their brainstem. No, seriously, um, I'm serious about that. So you, you may have relatives like that. You know, we certainly have a, a, a particular relative like that. And so when this person acts a certain way, you go, okay, well, there's their brainstem, which is unregulated. Remember, integration is the base of regulation. Right, so if you look at where your middle two fingernails are, just to give you an example of integration, this area is the prefrontal cortex behind your forehead. It, it's linking the, the cortex where you have your thinking and representations of higher ideas, like I'm gonna work on my wheel of awareness practice, for example. You, it's connecting to your limbic area where you mediate emotions and uh, with, the, with the body itself and the brainstem and motivations and attachment and memory. And then the brainstem, which has this fight, flight, freeze, faint response with the body proper, it integrates all that with the social world. So literally five sources of energy and information flow are integrated together. But when you flip your lid, like if a, a relative forgets to call you after something or someone tweets something weird to you or something, you can flip your lid. And when you flip your lid then, you're driven more by your limbic area and your brainstem and your reasoning cortex is out of the picture because literally you're flipping your lid. If you're a parent and doing this, it can be really scary for a kid and lead to what's called disorganized attachment. So in Parenting from the Inside Out, Mary Hartz and I wanted to make it clear that many parents flip their lids. So the issue is to make a repair. So there's no such thing as being perfect. What you want to look at in anybody, parent, public figure, anybody, is can someone say, you know something, what I did there was a mistake, I'm sorry. And to your kid, for example, you know, when, in fact, our kids don't let me write about them anymore in the parenting books I write because they're too old, they know better. But when I would write these examples and when I would flip my lid, whether it's in Brainstorm or Parenting from the Inside Out or The Whole Brain Child with Tina Bryson, all these books, you know, or Mindsight, you know, they, I, I had them read it for accuracy. And my son once, he said, it's accurate. He goes, what's, but what's wrong with you that you want to make this public? I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, because you look like such a jerk, you know? I said, well, that's exactly the point. Anybody can act like a jerk. The issue is to become aware of it with your cortex and say, you know something, that was not so good what I did. Let me apologize to you. Let me reconnect with you. Let me make a repair. Repair, 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 repair. What we want to do is loosen up our high expectations and achieve this sense of deep compassion for others and ourselves. Because when a person gets all rigid about what the brainstem is doing, then they act like they're not a person with a body with a brainstem. So you say, for example, this is one thing I'll just say, the brainstem works with the limbic area and even the cortex to make huge, for us human beings, huge in-group, out-group distinctions. There's a long set of research studies I won't summarize the details, but the bottom line is we know we have a brain that is prone to in-group, out-group distinctions. We have to rise above those now because it is going to kill us. We have to use the cortex to rise above the in-group, out-group distinction that we evolve with. If you're in from cave A, someone comes from cave B, you ought to kill them. That's, that's what kind of brain we have, right? And when we're under threat, we get kinder to the people from cave A and meaner to the people from cave B. That's just research proven. So what we need to do is use this consciousness, this presence to say, my brainstem and limbic area are now creating the in-group, out-group distinction, so I have this impulse to say this and that, but that's actually wrong. I'm gonna rise above it because civilization requires we become more integrated than our reptilian cousins. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Here we go. Hi. Hi. Can, can the mind actually repair a dementia or physically damaged brain? It's a great question. Can the mind repair dementia or the physically damaged brain? So let's take those as two separate things. In, the, in, in certain forms of dementia that, dementia that have progressed a lot, the very features of the mind you'd want to be using to actually try to repair the mind have deteriorated so much because it does depend on the brain that it you know it's so far what I've seen with full-on dementia um, this is not about prevention I'm going to talk about that in a moment 
but in terms of treatment, I, I, I haven't seen uh, positive results on what you could do if someone is in full-on dementia. So let's just be clear about that. We have a conference in March, which uh, I welcome you to check out, where we're having one of the world's experts, two of the world's experts, actually, on dementia there, and I'm going to ask them that same question on the panel, uh, Gary Small and, and Rudy Tanzi, uh, one, one from Harvard, the other from UCLA, because it's a crucial question, of course. But when you talk about prevention, that's a different thing. What you could do with your mind, meaning what you do with your body and your relationships, can actually prevent dementia. So we need to not just fall prey to the, all the genetic thing. Oh, it's your genetics, genetics. No, there's so much you can do actually with exercise, with keeping yourself active, with relationships, keeping yourself connected, with passion, with keeping your mind engaged, with mindfulness practices. That there's a lot of excitement, and we're going to talk about this in March at the UCLA conference on interpersonal neurobiology. You know about what you can do to prevent dementia. Now let's come to the idea of brain damage. Um, in the Mindsight book, I talk about a case of someone who had a severe car accident, and unfortunately she um, damaged her prefrontal cortex so severely that uh, the connection of her higher thinking and her motivational systems from the limbic area and the brainstem were so disrupted that she actually had no motivation to get better in her case. So if you read that case, you'll see, you know, I could help her family understand what happened, but she couldn't really recover very much. So that's a situation where sometimes you have to accept that even with brain damage, it can be the very circuits you need. There's a colleague of mine, Norman Doidge, has summarized a lot of neuroplasticity research on brain damage, let's say from strokes, and I'm now working actually with uh, some individuals with strokes about this, where we now know you can use the mind to stream energy and information through the brain to go around damaged circuits and harness the potential of the brain to grow new connections throughout the lifespan. So if you want to read summaries of that, Norman Doidge, D-O-I-D-G-E, his books are beautiful about that. But the general principle comes down to this. Where attention goes, neural firing flows, and neural connection grows. So by using your mind to focus attention in ways that are integrative, for example, you get the neurons in the brain to fire a certain way. This is the simple answer to the question, how can the mind change the brain? That's kind of goofy, people used to say to me all the time in the late 80s and 90s when I would say it. They go, that doesn't make any sense. The brain creates the mind. The brain creates the mind. Not so simple. Your mind can drive energy and information flow through your brain, so that's attention. Attention is what directs energy flow. Now, you're activating the neurons. Here's the key thing. When neurons are firing, they activate genes to get the synapses to grow. You can even get new neurons to grow. You can get myelin to form new myelin sheets. So here's the key thing. I'll give you an example. There's a researcher who did a study, someone who had a stroke 15 years earlier, paralyzed on the right side of his body. So he learned to use his left side of his body to do stuff, right? use his left hand to eat and stuff like that. So what this guy did, he was fired for it until they realized it worked and then someone else hired him. They strapped down the left arm. This guy's mind needs to eat. So soon, with his left arm strapped down over the course of just two weeks, 15 years of not moving, He's now moving his arm and eating. And in the film that was done about this, one of these guys like this, they show him playing piano with both hands. Unbelievable. I mean, not unbelievable. I mean, amazing. It's, it's, got to, it's believable because it actually happens. So, you know, it, here's the deal. In neuroscience, we used to be taught, when I went to medical school in the 70s, we were taught the brain is the one part of the brain that doesn't regenerate, one part of the body that doesn't regenerate. Right? That's wrong. Wrong. Your brain continues to grow throughout the lifespan. For everyone in this room, if I did my job as an educator, your brain has changed because of our experience together today. So take a look at those books, and there's every reason to find creative ways. If a person has the motivation, and you got those circuits that can drive attention, those are the two big things we want to look for. Um, and sometimes people are just depressed. So you want to get them out of their depression and then get them motivated and paying attention. So you really want to look at that very carefully. But yes, there's every reason to be very optimistic in this age of understanding how the mind can transform our brain and our relationships by creating more integration. 
Thank you. Thank you so much.